thank you so much uh, for staying till the bitter end here. I think I'm the, I think I'm the last part of the show, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So I'm the closer here. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different than what everybody else has been talking about, probably. Um, I want to do something that feeds your soul. Right, it's a little bit uh, of a different top topic of conversation than the technical and the business stuff that we've been talking about. Because what I believe is that while the things you do matter a lot, and how you do them matter a lot, the reason why you do things matters the most. The why you do something is probably the most important thing in making sure that you can be happy in what you do. Because if you embark on a journey to create something, whether it's a business or an app or a website or whatever it is that you're doing, it is a multi-year journey. You're gonna be spending your heart and soul doing something that you hope that you love because business will always throw you some challenges. It'll make you pivot, it'll make you think twice about what you're doing, the market will change on you, the funding will change on you. All of that stuff will cause you to think about why you do the things that you do. I'll start a little bit about me. I run this site called Cheeseburger. Uh, we also run other sites like Fail Blog, Know Your Meme, Meme Base, The Daily What. We are a network of sites that uh, were essentially a media company built on a technology platform. I started this company back in 2007 by buying our first website. I Can Has Cheeseburger, the cat picture website that you guys probably know about, was about eight months old when I uh, purchased it. And that's how I formed this company. And the idea was back then that we could actually buy a bunch of these and flip it for a profit a few years later. And then something miraculous happened. The 2008 recession, yep. It actually started September of 2007, which is exactly the month that I started my company. I didn't know it at the time, but we were about to head into the, one of the worst recessions of our lifetime. And while I was actually uh, brought on as supposed to be a caretaker CEO to do the deal, you know, put a bunch of stuff together and then sell it, that recession gave me an opportunity to actually test my metal to see if I can grow something. Not just put something together, but to actually build something that I could be proud of. So, back, uh, back in 2010, November 2010, um, I received a choice. The choice was either I take venture funding and recapitalize my investors and buy them out and grow a venture-backed company. And up to this point, I had been running a profitable blog network business, or I sell. I get out, I have my millions, I walk off into the sunset, maybe do something crazy. So the choice, I was very, very lucky to have this choice. Um, I took the red pill as you see me standing here. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. We're very familiar with this line, but you will probably encounter some shade of this along your path, whether it's shutting down, whether it's being acquired, whether it's being acquired somewhere in the middle, whatever it is, or maybe a partnership, maybe it's a revenue deal. You make these choices in ways that you don't understand how it'll impact your life. So. I'm going to show you what happens when you actually go down to the belly of the beast. So I took that money. Uh, we ended up raising $30 million in our Series A uh, from uh, four VC firms. And that was a crap ton of money back then, still is today. Uh, and the, the common refrain was, what the hell are they doing giving that much money to a cat picture network or cat picture blog? <laughs> Oh, we had dreams, right? We wanted to do much more with that money. We know, we know that there was a market for the stuff that people wanted to entertain themselves. That they didn't just want to sit back and watch television. I feel a little a little weird saying that in LA. But entertainment was about to change and we were actually generating content from the users and we were leading that charge even though it was simple photos and, and text and very simple technology behind it. The reason why is that we have a mission statement. Cheeseburger's mission is to make the world happy for a few moments every day. Very simple. We don't need to cure cancer. We, didn't, we don't need to bring you world, world peace. Our little mission was to give you a little escape, a few minutes that you could just spend enjoying whatever it is that you wanted to laugh at. <coughs> and the reason we believe that that could work is that we believe that platforms were the future of media. That if you wanted to be a media company, that's a perfectly fine and good business and billions of dollars worth of businesses are, are, are built on it. But if you really, really wanted to grow, you had to build a platform, a tool, and a, a, a stable foundation in which other people 
could also build their future on. We also believe that virality, as much as we helped invent that uh, category, uh, was no match for what you and your friends wanted to see. The virality at its core was what I wanted to share with my small group of friends. And lastly but not least, while clickbait draws the attention, self-expression is at the core of everything that we create. And so with these beliefs, we actually continue to actually build product and we wanted to change our core competency. And what happens is that when you sign up to go on a multi-year journey, everybody wants to believe. Right? You all desperately want to believe in the destination that you're headed to, that you want to actually get there together as a team, all that stuff. And there's this proud, almost ego-driven mission behind it. But the fact of the matter is, you got to deliver. That's what you do day in, day out. You're delivering pizza, but in a little bit different way, in a way that stands out. You're delivering on the same value proposition as what really exists today, but in a novel way. I just heard, uh, heard people talk about uh, Meerkat and, and uh, Periscope, right? I mean, what, was, what came before that? Justin TV, right? And so we're sometimes just making an iteration better than the last thing that came about, but we have to actually deliver on it, not just dream about it. So for three years, three years, we changed our core competency from curating and media to media plus technology. That we wanted to build a team of engineers and product people that could actually build software. And I totally underestimated this. I, I did not realize how long it would actually take for us to go and build a technological foundation for all the stuff that we did. Uh, we were hosted on WordPress.com. And if you guys know WordPress, it's fantastic, right? At one point, we were serving one out of every seven page views on WordPress.com was our sites, right? And all of a sudden, one day, we flipped the switch and it went to our infrastructure. Holy crap. You don't realize how bad people are at scale. Like we, human beings are terrible at scaling, right? We don't have a sense of how big things can be or how small they can be. We just kind of live in this biological shell and we don't realize that billions and billions of calls are handled very, very differently than even hundreds of millions of requests. And those things are really hard lessons to learn and it costs a lot of money to do that and it costs time for your engineers to figure this out. But we did, and it took us a few years, but we're very proud of the effort that we put forth. And in that process, the world went from desktop web to kind of mobile web to the world of apps. Not only did we have to actually learn a new core competency, but we actually had to do it in a brand new environment because the market had changed. Remember that journey, the multi-year journey? You're never going to end up where you thought you're going to end up. And that was true for us as well. And in the process, we learned a few things. That while ambition is great, and I'm a pretty ambitious guy, clarity trumps ambition every fucking time. You can have all the ambition you want, but it's just a dream unless you can actually make that message clear for other people to execute on it, for other people to believe in it. If you can't tell a clear story, then why the hell would anybody else believe in you? A lot of people love minimalist apps. A lot of people love to actually shrink things down to its basic components. Um, but minimalism is not the same thing as simplicity. Minimalism sometimes doesn't do anything, whereas simplicity helps you get one thing done. And, or maybe two things, right? The simplicity of having to build an app and strip down all the core uh, value propositions we had on the desktop and transform it for the app was a difficult, gut-wrenching process because we had users who are used to doing things a certain way on the web. But on the mobile environment, that becomes rather difficult. People's behavior paradigms change. And you can't just port one to the other, you have to understand a whole new behavior. Also, while you might have great strategy, while you might hire the best thinkers in the business, while you might talk to the best advisors, best investors, they don't run your business. You gotta listen to your customers. We made that mistake a few times, and we listened, and we iterated. And the only thing that's gonna save you from making an error is not getting it right, it's listening. Because that speed of iteration is what's going to help you listen and iterate, listen and iterate. And every time you listen, you'll miss something. But that iterative process will help you solve that. And so we've got much, much, much better at listening. So let's fast forward to 2013. Three-year process of building our apps. I realized that I was in a really difficult situation. Um, this is Atlas. He's holding the universe on his shoulders, right? We're very familiar with that image. 
Um, and I asked myself, how did it get so fucking complicated? We were posting cat photos on the internet when I started. <laughs> totally true, right? We were giving people a way to upload photos and caption them, share them with their friends. Very simple. But three years later, having to rebuild our technology platform, having to hire and fire people to create revenue and balance partnerships, all that stuff, it got really complicated. And then I realized that there was a myth. I'm sorry, this is what we did. I missed the slide. So that, that, that's how simple it should be. It should be that easy. But the greatest lie ever told to entrepreneurs is this idea that you hold the world upon your shoulders. If you ever want to start a business, you can't think like this. This will crush you. You have a team. If you're doing this yourself, you probably have a terrible team. Right? Number one symptom of a person or a CEO or an entrepreneur who has a bad team is when they do everything themselves. It's not to say that the people that they hired are bad. It's much more likely that you as an entrepreneur took on too much stuff and isn't delegating enough so you're not using their full potential. And so I had learned to delegate. Uh, I had to learn to communicate. I had learned to let go of the things that I wanted to give them the tools to accomplish what they wanted to do. And that, that clarity, rather than my ambition, having clarity about where we wanted to go together was going to be instrumental in getting the most out of my employees. So, 2014. For us, the recovery plan after figuring out that building technology was really hard, build a great team, and I also needed to get coaching. I don't know how many of you work with CEO coaches or uh, uh, executive coaches or what have you, but I highly recommend finding somebody who is going to be in your corner looking out for your interests and your interests alone who can be there on a regular basis that you schedule time with, that you create discipline around talking to them about what you're thinking. All the stuff that we think about that goes through our head, if you talk it out loud with somebody who understands the business, who understands your industry, that's good. But you also need to make sure that they're invested in your success. And that's what coaches can do. And lastly, what that helped me do was bring back the joy in what we did. I have a really amazing job, right? My job is to make people laugh just for a few minutes every day. Nothing serious, nothing grandiose, nothing all that difficult, nothing all that stressful. But in the middle of the business, you forget that. Middle of operating a company, you forget those things. And so my goal was to bring back the joy. Because if I'm unhappy, how can I deliver on my mission to bring happiness to the world? The first thing I realized about my happiness is that I love to learn, that I really enjoy um, learning new things. And so I started going down my bucket list. I stopped waiting. I stopped putting my life on hold for my company. And I started waking up early, which I hate to do, and learn how to fly. That's me in the plane. And that's awesome. I started to understand what life was all about. And I also started to recognize and confront my fears. I'll read this out to you. One day, a British, uh, Buddhist saint left his cave to gather firewood. When he returned, he found his cave taken over by demons. He tried forcefully to get them out of his cave, but the demons aren't phased. The saint lets out a deep breath of surrender, knowing now that these demons will not be manipulated into leaving. He looks into the eyes of each demon and says, it's like, it looks like we're going to be here together. I open myself to whatever you have to teach me. In that moment, all but one demon disappears. One last and huge and fierce demon remains, the big hairy monster. So he lets go even further. Eat me if you wish. He places his head in the, mouth of, in the demon's mouth, and at that moment, the last demon bows and dissolves into space. This is a story about the things that we fear the most. And while we are probably very smart people who can figure out how to manage our fears effectively, if you don't actually understand it, if you don't actually give in to your fears and recognize that they exist, you will always just be running away from them. My fear is that I'm not a good leader. A lot of people have this fear, that I was thrust into this by some quirk of fate and accident, that I'm not uh, a person who's been endowed with some magical power of leadership. And so I didn't realize that that fear would cause me to make poor decisions, that it would cause me to make errors in how I hired and the things that I wanted to do, that I would let my ego drive the process. And so I learned a lot more about leadership, recognizing that I had a fear of not being a leader. 
Leadership emerges after some rite of passage, often a stressful one. This crucible is an essential element of being a leader. Leaders emerge from their crucibles stronger and unbroken. But the challenge here is that you must pass through the burdens and the difficulties yourself. That you must experience them firsthand and you must acknowledge them in order to get out on the other side and become a leader. For me, getting out meant finding the joys in my strengths, the things that I was good at. Um, I have a hard time admitting that I like attention. Okay, Here I am standing in front of you on a stage wearing a giant t-shirt that's got my company name on it and I'm telling you that I have a real difficult time admitting that I like attention. I even had a reality show, right? It's like, it's sure, let's just admit it. Once I admitted that, it became a lot easier. It became a lot easier to say, you know what? I'm actually good at getting attention. I'm actually good at communicating. Let's use that to the advantage of my company. I'm also a creative person and I'm a salesperson. I thought I was gonna be technical when I first started my career. I learned a few, uh, I learned a little bit how to code and then I realized I wasn't very good at it. I was really, I thought I was really good at creating product. So I became a product manager. And then I found out there's a lot of people who are like really that much better at me at product than I am. So the only role that was remaining was to be a salesperson, right? That's the three roles of every startup. Technical, product, or sales. And I'm not talking about going out and beating the streets and actually getting clients. The seller of ideas, the seller of opportunity, it's the same thing. We're selling a promise that we hope to deliver on. And that's what I'm good at. And if I accept that, then I can be the best CEO for the company that I can be. And every time I feel that fear that I may not be a good enough leader, maybe um, I'm in a you know, negative, depressing state, I found a way to get to my happy place. The happy place for me is to imagine myself as a little speck of dust in the universe and to say, not in a negative way, that nothing I do really matters. Strange. Right? All of us start companies so that we can matter. All of us start companies so we can put a dent in the universe. But even Steve Jobs doesn't really matter in the end. What matters to me is doing what I feel like is the right thing to do. Doing what I feel like is the right thing for my company, for my family, for my friends, for the people who love me. That's it, super simple. Don't make it too complicated. So for me, I go there and I realize that I'm just a speck of dust in a giant universe and I get to do what I want to do. So this year, unfortunately, as much as I can meditate or get coaching, the reality is still there. I still need to generate revenue. I still need to ship products. I still need to get customers. I still need to do all that. We still need to deliver on our promise. But the difference is why. It's not that I need to deliver. It is that I want to deliver that I'm in a position in my career, in my life, in a place where I really enjoy doing the things that I do, and that gives me the ability to run. And in comparison, so I call this the 21st century California gold rush. I've been watching the state, close enough. So, this is the gold rush. Uh, this is a picture of 1800s Chinese American gold miners in California. I had no idea these people existed. What's weird about their gold rush versus ours is that we do not die. Well, most of us anyway. They probably died, many of them. Many gold miners went up into the mountains and never came back. We have the luxury and the safety of support, modern technology. We have all the advantages in this gold rush that those people never had. And that should make us happy and feel fortunate. So what, if you're not gonna die, what is the worst likely outcome of being an entrepreneur today? You leave your company, you start a new one, you build an app, it fails, what happens? You're still alive, maybe a few pounds heavier. <laughs> you have much, much more experience, and chances are you can probably leave your low-paying startup job and go get more, much more money at a bigger company with the experience that you've gained. Not a bad scenario, isn't it? It's awesome. So that's why I love taking this risk, these risks. There really is no downside other than your ego and your belief about who you are. And if you know that you do not matter, that becomes a lot easier. You can just pursue the thing that makes you happy. Lastly, um, this idea of changing the world. Uh, I, sometimes I can't tell if I'm doing as important or not important, right? Is giving people something to do while they wait in line at Starbucks really all that important, right? 
is giving people the ability to caption cat photos really all that important in the universe? You could argue it one, every single way to Sunday. The answer is there's no spoon. The question doesn't really matter. It's not about the outside world, it's about why you do the thing that you do and if you are secure and stable in what you want to do, then you'll be fine. Because there are only cats, there are no spoons. <laughs> Thank you very much. Visit appalliance.org to access resources and join a global network of developers.